Yes, good morning to all of you. It's a privilege to be here. I'm very, I had a very good time. I've been here for 10 days now. I have two sisters living in Canada, so Canada is not, uh, uh, you know, a, a foreign country for me now. They are Canadians, and uh, so I've uh, been coming to Canada on and off, but never to Vancouver. So uh, I had heard about uh, your beautiful city and uh, uh, wanted to visit, especially the Iranian Christian community here, but I never succeeded. Uh, but I'm very glad to be here. We had a wonderful conference the last three days with uh, three, four churches gathering, Iranian communities gathering, and uh, it was uh, 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 encouraging, really, to see how God is touching Iranians uh, here in Canada, especially in Vancouver. Uh, thank you, uh, Randy, for uh, the introduction. Yes, I, uh, I was born in Iran, and uh, my dad was a medical doctor who heard about Jesus when he was studying. Uh, medicine from a professor friend, an American professor friend, about Jesus. And they were told that Jesus was alive and could change, transform a man's life. Uh, he went to a Bible study a couple of times, didn't continue, and after finishing his studies, he went to another part of the country and started practicing medicine. He had lost his faith in God by reading Quran, and the only God he knew was money. And he was trying to earn as much of it as he could. But there, were, there came a time that he was in debt, he was in depression, and uh, he was really desperate for a way out. And one night, years after he had heard about Jesus, in a very small town in the northern part of Iran where I was born, there was no Christian there. He just one night remembered that sentence from his friend that Jesus was alive and could transform a man's life. And he prayed to Jesus, Jesus, I don't believe in you. I don't think that you are uh, hearing me. But if what my friend told me is true and you do hear me, please transform me. I hate myself and I want to be a new person. So he went to sleep after many sleepless nights and woke up in the morning, forgot about his prayer last night and went to the hospital where he used to work because he felt better. So he went there and 11 o'clock in the morning, his technician who used to take x-rays for him came to him with two booksellers and told him, Dr. Fatih, these booksellers just came to the hospital and we thought, who reads books here? And we thought, ah, oh, Dr. Fatih reads books. So we brought them to you. Please have a look, see what they have. And uh, the first book that they showed my dad was a copy of the New Testament. And he was shocked and he felt what this is weird this is not uh, London this is not even Tehran the capital this is Lahijan a very small town no Christians are here and I prayed to Jesus last night and someone comes and gives me a copy of the, his book this is not an accident this Jesus must be alive and he is a gentleman and so he just bought the New Testament and many other books World of Flame by Billy Graham and others, and went home and started reading and was transformed into a new person. I was 10 years old. This was about 10 years before the Islamic Revolution. There was no Christian in our town. There was not much interest in Christianity in those days. But he was changed, and we noticed that. And uh, later on, our mom told us that your dad has become a Christian. And because the change was so good and my mom was happy, no one dared to say anything to my dad. And the whole family was Muslim. And many came to Christ. The home church started in our house and uh, uh, we grew up in, in that family. Later on, I gave my, lay, my life to Christ, entered into full-time ministry, and I had a heart for uh, teaching the Bible. Amen. And later I went to London, 1990, end of 91. And the interesting thing was that in the first, first Sunday that I went to the church there, this was years after, uh, you know, these things happened. And there an Englishman came to me and said, 
shook hand with me and speak, spoke in Farsi and said, do you know who I am? I looked at him and said, no, I have no idea. This is the first Sunday I am here. And he said, I am one of those who sold those, that book to, to your dad. Years ago, I was just shocked. And uh, the interesting thing is that I met a brother here who knows this man, Malcolm Steer. And uh, when I came here, he said, I am a friend of Malcolm. And Malcolm Steer, one of the OM team who sold that New Testament to my dad, later he became the chairman of our college. So we, we are closely working together, and he is a co-pastor with me in the Iranian Christian Fellowship. So God is doing wonderful things in Iran. And uh, I know that these days... Uh, Canadians are brought much closer to Iranians through the uh, sad story of this plane crash and what has happened. And, uh, uh, but I'm here today to talk about uh, good news, good things that are happening in the midst of all the turmoil, in the midst of all the bad things that are happening in this world. And these days, Iran is at the center. I'm just wondering, you know, when I open the news, Iran is usually the first, not usually good news, it's the bad news. But I'm here to tell you that something wonderful is happening in Iran. So, uh, the blessing of Abraham. I want to read uh, from Acts chapter 3. I love to read large, big passages from the scripture. So I'm going to read the whole chapter, and I'm going to then make some comments there. So bear with me, please. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong, and leaping up, He stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them, In the portico called Solomon's, astounded. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us? As though by our own power or piety we have made him walk. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate. When he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one. And asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life. Whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And his name, his name, by faith in his name. Has made this man strong. Whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus. Has given the man the perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out. The times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for the, restoring, for the restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy people's prophets long ago. Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like 
me from your brothers, you shall listen to him in whatever he tells you. And it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. And all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those who came after him also proclaimed these days, you are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. Heavenly Father, please speak to us through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Abraham's blessing for all the nations, and that includes Iran and beyond. I want to give you first a close shot of what we just read. The healing of a lame man at the beautiful gate. When we look at the passage, you see a lame man begging by the beautiful gate. Handicapped. Needy and hopeless. Not even noticed because he had become part of the decor there. And excluded. Excluded. Especially from the worship. They were going into the temple to enjoy the presence of God. But this man, because of his infirmity, was not allowed to go in. That was a great exclusion for him. I want to use this story, actually, at the same time that it is about a lame man walking there. And I will explain what that meant at that time. But I want also to use it as a parable for the spiritual condition of Muslims today. And when we read this, these characteristics, in my view, is so well describes the situations of the Muslims. They are, in some ways, close to us. They are, they know themselves as the, you know, Abrahamic uh, religions. And there, there are many more, you know, common grounds, much more common ground between us Christians and them if we compare it with Hindus or Buddhists or many others. So they seem to be close, but they are excluded. They are handicapped. And for long, they have not been even noticed. Peter and John's response to the situation, that is very interesting. They had been going to that place for long, you know, back for years. But this was after Pentecost. This is chapter 3, after what happened. And they react differently. They look carefully, the Bible says, carefully. They looked at him, maybe for the first time. They looked at this lame man. Grabbing his attention. Look at us. Look into our eyes. An eye-to-eye encounter. Maybe they never did that. They just ignored him for years when they were going to pray. And just think about Muslims also as we look at these characteristics. And they offered him what they had, the name of Jesus. He thought that he was going to get some alms from them, but they had a much bigger blessing. And I think maybe here in Canada or in England where I live, Many Muslim refugees come for different things, you know, to reside in the country, to benefit from the good things that there are, receiving something, but we have a much, much greater thing to give to them. And that is the name of Jesus. That is, that is what, what they really need. So Peter and John, this time, they had something to give, something much bigger, and they offered it to him. And not only they prayed for him, for this lame man. They stretched out their hands, took him by the right hand. And I think Muslims need that. Not only the evangelism, but the right hand to pick them up, help them walk, you know. And I'm so glad that our brother Randy, that I'm staying with, and Margo and others here are just doing that. They are not only giving the gospel to them, but they are, you know, helping them walk and 
helping them go forward. The healing has happened. His feet and legs were strengthened. He jumped up, stood on his feet, and started walking. Wow. Jumped up and down and praised the Lord. And most importantly, he entered the presence of God and worshipped him with them. For the first time in his life, he didn't stay there. He went into the temple. This is the close shot. And we look closely at what has happened. Then I want to give you a wide angle. Connected with a bigger event that was happening. And this was part of that. The healing of the lame man was not just some, you know, specific event not connected with other things. The healing of the lame man should be seen as part of what happened at Pentecost and Easter. Paul, uh, Peter, speaks of times of refresh, refreshing. He interprets what had happened when these people come, run to them. Wondering, amazed, what has happened? They looked at them as if they have healed this person. And he said, no, no, we have not done this. This is part of a much bigger thing that is happening. A time of refreshing, the time of strengthening of God's people, Israel, that had become weak, that had gone again into a different kind of, a deeper kind of a slavery to sin. Though they, had, though they were in their own country, but they knew that they were captives still. And they needed this strengthening times of refreshing. And Peter is saying to them that this walking of this lame man is, 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 is one a part of that refreshing. That the strengthening of God's people. As Isaiah from, you know, throughout his book. I had prophesied, read chapter 35, lame man will will walk because God is pouring his spirit on dry ground and and, and deserts are going to be transformed into beautiful gardens. And he talks about uh, blind becoming healed and lame start walking. and, 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 And Peter is saying that this is part of that. This is happening. Pentecost has happened. When, when the 12 uh, apostles, Jesus told them, wait, wait in Jerusalem because something is going to happen. You have to receive power from on high because the spirit has come to, is going to fall on you and you should receive power. You will be strengthened. You will be refreshed. And then you will become a witness. And it's this time of refreshing. It is part of this time that this lame man is walking. We have experienced this refreshing. And that's why in the name of Jesus, this man is walking before your eyes. So this is part of a much bigger plan. Times of refreshing has come down. God's promises of healing and and strengthening has started. God is renewing his rule over his people. His kingdom has come. Has started as Jesus the Nazareth have said to us. This is part of it, part of what it meant for the weak and captive people of God to receive power from on high, to be baptized with the Spirit, to become true witnesses of Him to the whole world. This is the wide picture, wide shot that you have to see this event. But I want to give you even a wider shot here, a wider shot than even that refreshing time. That is part of an even bigger picture, an act in a bigger drama, the first fruits of a bigger harvest. (coughs) Peter talks about the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham, the blessing of all the families of the earth. That is what is happening. Peter is telling them, The blessing of all the families of the earth. The realization of all that God's prophets spoke about. That is a much bigger, wider picture. The new heaven and the new earth. The new creation in Christ. The restoration 
of all things. This is what is happening. This, this walking of this lame man is part of times of refreshing for God's people, the strengthening of God's people. And that is strengthening and refreshing of God's people is part of the restoration of all things that God is going to do. That is his plan. Amen. Yes, that is very exciting. Uh, Peter and John are telling these Jews. Then they appeal to these, to these people. Say, this is what is happening before your eyes. This is the good news you have always heard about. And that is for us too. Because we are God's people today. And God wants to refresh us and strengthen us. In order for us to become, to become like Peter and John. You know, the agents of restoration. The agents of God's blessing reaching the whole earth. All the families of the earth, including the Iranians and Muslims, who were so ignored and, you know, sometimes even we thought that they are out of touch. Blessing of Abraham for the Muslim world? That is what is happening. Don't be just passive spectators. Peter is telling these people who are watching Participate in God's drama of new creation. Of God's kingdom coming with power. Of all the families of the earth being blessed. And that is what God is telling us today. Telling you today. That is what is happening before your eyes. Don't just be spectators. Come and enter into the drama. This is for you too. Peter is saying don't just stand there and watch. Change your ways. Repent. Repent. Receive the power of the Spirit. Join the act. Join the act. For most of the last 14 centuries, it seemed that the Muslim families of the earth were excluded from Abraham's blessing. Nothing much has happened. In the last 14 centuries. Even missionaries almost lost all hope that is it possible for Muslims to come to Christ? Is Jesus also for the Muslim world? Or are they going to resist him to the end of the days? But praise God, a new wind is blowing in the house of Islam these days. God is drawing Muslims from all over the world to faith in Jesus Christ, as David Garrison has explored in his book, uh, 2014, Wind in the House of Islam, and talking about movements of God among Muslims in different places. And it seems, according to Garrison and many others, that Iran seems to be at the center of this great storm. Thousands, thousands are coming to Christ. As I heard, I saw in your leaf, this small paper, Iran indeed has, is regarded by Operation World, the book published by OM, Operations Mobilization. Iran has the highest rate of church growth in the world. Look at that book. It's not, I'm not saying that. Uh, Operation World, Patrick Johnson and others who have, who are publishing that book, they, they say it, that Iran has the highest rate. I remember when I was a teenager, as a Christian, I was growing, I always thought of China, you know, you're thinking of China, China had the highest rate of church growth, and we always, you know, envy China. Is it possible for God to do something like that in Iran? Those days, the number of Iranians from a Muslim, ba- a Muslim background were not even 500. Much less than that, actually. But something has started. An explosion of Christianity. That is a title that Open Doors, maybe you know about them, gave me in a, a series of talks. They asked me to talk about the explosion of Christianity in Iran. Wow. That's the title they gave me. 
that I should talk about. Thousands are coming to the Lord. What is going on? I just had a very short snapshot of a story of Christianity. Christianity is not that new to Iran. Before 1979, the Islamic revolution, the Islamic regime, we see Christianity way, be, way before. It started maybe even with the wise men from the east. Many believe they were Iranians, the three wise men or whatever number they were. Then in the day of Pentecost, the first three groups that are mentioned who heard Peter preach, the Medes, the Parthians, and the Elamites, the first three groups are Iranians. They were from Iran, and they heard the message of Peter. And they, many believe that they went back to Iran, and they established the church back in Iran. Iran had 110 dioceses in the six, between 6th and 8th centuries. Many Christians there. They took the gospel to China even. In the seventh century, they were known in those days of the Church of the Martyrs. Thousands and thousands of Iranians got killed at the dynasty of Sassanids, killed them. The story tells that even in one day, 100,000 were martyred. And the Church of Iran was known as the Church of the Martyrs. So Christianity is not new to Iran. It has, it has its history back. Then, of course, Islamic invasion. And I don't want to go into details of what happened, but uh, it faded out. But there were always two Christian minorities, Armenians and Assyrians, back in Iran. But the missionary movement started 150 years ago doing a lot. But the fruit was not much. Contrary to all that people expected after 1979, when many thought that that would be the end of Christianity in Iran by the coming of the regime, it was the beginning of the revival when the Islamic regime came and it started, the awakening started. Why? Why Iran became the fastest growing church, hosting the fastest growing church? Many reasons. I among them disillusionment with Islam when you talk to Iranians in Iran. A majority are deeply disillusioned and disappointed. Not only with the regime, but with Islam. Political oppression, overwhelming social problems, shaking of the foundations of morality and culture. Iran is number two in drug addiction in the world. They have... Seven million people affected by drug addiction. All these contributed to Iranians searching, searching for a, for a new faith, searching for a true God, a different God. Martyrdoms in the 90s, many pastors were killed in the seed, and the blood of the martyrs is known to be the seed of the church. 24-7 Christian TV broadcasting is bringing the message of the gospel into the country. Thanks God, thank God for technology. No one can block it. So, and God's supernatural work. You can hardly find an Iranian who hasn't seen Jesus in a dream or vision. And so many miracles are happening. Jesus is meeting with people. And as a result, the explosion has started. Thousands of house churches are mu is mushrooming all over Iran. We are training leaders of underground church. And we are closely in touch with many of these networks of house churches. God is doing something wonderful there. Estimates, nobody can do an exact estimate, but estimates range between 450,000 to 3 million believers from a Muslim background. There was a survey done uh, two, three years ago on how many Iranians watch uh, Superbook. I don't know whether you know about Superbook, this cartoon that is made for children. And it's broadcast by these Christian channels for 24 hours uh, into Iran. And there was a survey done by a secular company asking people through their mobile phones whether they watch Superbook. And the result of that survey shows that actually the number of Christians in Iran 
are nearer to the more optimistic figure rather than the pessimistic figure. Nearer to 3 million than to 500,000. Something very, very special is happening. And the strange and wonderful thing is that Iranians are coming to Christ from all the different strata of society. From educated and illiterate, from young and old, from rich and poor, from religious and secular, urban and rural. It's not limited to a specific group or specific you know, level of society. People are coming to Christ from all the different groups. There's a story that I always tell of an elderly lady whose son, a student, becomes a Christian. At first, she's upset. And uh, she, uh, you know, is not happy with, with her son. But then she sees that her, his son, her son uh, is changed in a positive way. And she is interested, become interested. And the son speaks to her mother about this elderly, illiterate lady. And uh, because she couldn't read, the son would bring... Uh, DVDs and CDs for her to uh, listen. And after some time, she becomes a Christian and gr grows up in, 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 in her faith. And there comes a time that she wants to serve the Lord. So she prays to Jesus, Jesus, I want to serve you. How can an elderly, illiterate woman in Iran serve Jesus? So what she thinks, God puts in her heart. She, 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 wants, she starts evangelizing in buses in uh, public transport buses. So she goes into a bus. She takes number of Matthew's gospel, especially asks her friends to underline the Sermon on the Mount, especially the Beatitudes, you know, all of that. And she goes into a bus and prays and looks around and finds a young man or a young girl and goes and sits by them. And then after a couple of minutes, looks at them and says, my dear, could you please read these passages for me? I can't read, and a friend of mine has given me this, you know. And of course, you know, a young girl or young boy respects an elderly lady, and they said, oh, of course, you know, gets it and starts reading the underlined passages. I said, wow, what is this? Where did you get this from? I mean, this, this is a friend of mine has given it to me. And after a couple of more minutes, she says, my dear, my ear is a little bit heavy, you know, and I can't hear well. Could you read a little louder, please? <laughs> <laughs> the girl or boy says, yes, of course I, I, I can read louder. So what happens is that this girl is reading the most beautiful sermon ever preached in a loud voice. And the people who are sitting in the, uh, you know, the row back and, you know, in front, they are all listening to this sermon, and you know. And if she feels confident and she's not as scared, she has a small notebook, you know. And he asks them to write their phone number, to ask the friends to contact them. And many have come to the Lord through this lady. Her weakness has become her strength. If you have a weakness that can become your strength in the hands of the Lord, give it to him and he can use it, you know. Praise God. Another story I want to tell you here. It's a story of my pastor, Edward of Sepian. And I usually tell this story. They were back in Iran. Now they are in UK, but they were back in Iran and they were going to visit a Muslim convert in the city of Qom. It was a very religious city. So on the way... They went to buy some water from a shop. And Edward's wife, Anahid, who is now with the Lord, she was a great evangelist. And uh, she used to speak to pe people a lot. Sometimes, middle of the night, she just remembered that she hadn't spoken to anyone that day. She would wake, woke up and go into the streets till she speak to someone. So she, has, she had spoken to thousands of people. So that day, they go into that shop. They park the car, go into the shop to buy water. And there was a tall, gentle man, very religiously looking with beards and dressed like a very fanatic Muslim, standing by the adjacent shop uh, window of the adjacent shop. And Anahid looks at him, and as always, she wants to 
uh, you know, give a gospel or a piece of his scripture to him, you know. And as they come out of the shop, bought, bought the water, she tells Pastor Edward, Edward, uh, I want to give a, a piece of, you know, a gospel of Luke to this gentleman who is standing there. Edward looks at this man with this, you know, beard and fanatic looking person. He says, Anai, don't you see? This is dangerous. We are going to come and this is a very, you know, a religious city. You want to put us in trouble? Leave your uh, evangelism for another time. I mean, this is not a place to give a gospel to this man who is clearly a very fanatic Muslim. So Anahit goes with Pastor Edward, gets into the car, and they drive, drove away. And as they are driving away, Anahit looks at Edward and says, hey, Edward, when the day comes that I stand in front of the judgment seat of Christ, and he asks me why you didn't give my book to that man standing there. I will say Edward didn't let me do that. <laughs> and they start arguing with one another. And Edward's conscience pricked him. And I say, okay, Anahid, okay, we will turn around and go. And if he is still there, we will give that gospel to him. And they turn around and go there. And the man is still there. Oh, Anahid wants to jump out of the car and give this gospel to him. Edward says, no, Anahid. I am going to do it. You are going to put us in trouble. So Pastor Edward gets a copy of the gospel of Luke or whatever and go down shaking and scared towards this man who is standing there and go towards him and says, sir, I am a pastor. I am a Christian. I have a gift for you. I want to give you this. This is a book of Jesus, and I want to give it to you. This man looks at Edward, and tears start coming off his eyes. Edward is shaken. He says, what is happening? Have I said something wrong? Have I offended him? He says, sir, did I, did I say something wrong? I didn't want to offend you. I'm so sorry. The man says, no, sir, no. You haven't done anything wrong. You see, I don't live anywhere near here. I heard about Jesus from satellite TV six months ago. And I gave my life to Christ. And these six months I have been looking everywhere for a copy of the gospel. And I couldn't find. And this morning, I woke up with a voice calling me. And told me, get up, get up. I'm going to take you to my servant. Who is going to give you my book. And I got up and I got into my car. And I've been driving for one hour. And when I came close to this place, the same voice told me, go and stand there. And my servant will come to you and will give you my book. And I have been waiting here for long. <laughs> and when you came with your wife and you went into the shop, the, so the voice told me, this is the man. But you came out and you drove away. And I became very sad. And I thought maybe all that was my imagination. But thank you so much for coming back. And he got the gospel and he started kissing it as Muslims, you know, uh, kissed Quran and thanked Edward. And he now is part of the home house churches, house church network over there. God is, God is bringing people to Christ. There is a unique opportunity I have to uh, speed up. God, God, God is doing fantastic work in Iran. Christianity can become a social, cultural, and a spiritual force in that country. Iran can become a gateway to other Muslim countries. Persecution have started. They are closing churches. They have closed all the churches. They are clamping down house churches, harassing Christians, expelling believers from their jobs, arresting them, imprisoning them, torturing sometimes, and forcing leaders to leave the country. A lot is happening but if God is for us, who can be against us? Amen. There are so many stories. One of our students who have been put into prison twice, actually, and have been in prison over three years. And one of these imprisonments, the mullah started coming and visiting them on Fridays because like pastors who go and visit, you know, prisons, this mullah used to come. And he started befriending this group of Christians, this student of us. And uh, 
wanted to bring them back to Islam. But gradually, a friendship started. And there came a time, there came a time that this mullah tells this group of uh, Christians, young Christians, that, you know, is there anything that you like me to bring with me next time that I come to visit you? They, they thought that maybe they like a certain kind of food or something. And they immediately said, can you bring us a copy of the Bible? This mullah got a little bit scared and said, you know, I can't, I can't bring a Bible into prison. I mean, this, this, I'm, a, I'm a mullah. I'm, I'm, I'm coming here to, you know, help you uh, go back to, uh, you know, for, for Islam and I will see. And he goes. And after two weeks or three weeks, he comes back with, you know, a book wrapped up into a newspaper under his rope. And he comes into them and opens this. Uh, and there was an English, English Bible in King James Version. <laughs> and he says, I'm so sorry I didn't find anything else. You know, this is what I found. And this uh, student, he got excited and said, oh, no, thank you very much. It's wonderful. And there was one of them who could read English. And what they did, they started translating King James. And I have the translations that they have made in the prison. They did many of the Pauline episodes. They did part, a number of Psalms, Gospel of Mark, I believe, and a number of others. And they were started writing them on pieces of paper and distributing it in, the, in, the, in, in prison. And the, this, this man now came out. He is married to an English, English, English woman and uh, serving the Lord. God is doing, even speaking to people in, in prisons. So I, I bring my uh, talk to an end by just saying that what we are doing at PARS, we feel that it's such an urgency to develop leaders for this fast-growing church. So uh, I'm working, I've started PARS Theological Center to train leaders for this movement and our mission is to train a new generation of leaders who are deeply rooted in scripture and, you know, mature people, faithful, effective leaders. And we are helping them into a fourfold goal of loving God, loving oneself, loving the church, loving the world. And there are, I believe, some pictures. There is our school of theologies providing online courses, formation conferences, uh, mentoring and ministerial practice, so combining different approaches to train these people. We have some pictures of some of our students there that shows that they, they, they are studying. They are, they are being trained and shaped and formed to lead this wonderful movement of God's spirit. To sum it up, the lame men are walking before our eyes, before your eyes. Everywhere in the world they are coming to Christ. Muslims are, are coming to Christ. And these lame men and women may be close to you when you are walking, where you are, I don't know, buying something or in the street or in your neighborhood. You know, look into their eyes. Give Give them the name of Jesus. You have the opportunity to enter this act, this drama, this adventure. Take, take his, her right hand and help them walk. Muslims are coming to Christ all over. Don't be only spectators. Join God's adventure. Participate in God's drama. God is saving Muslims these days. There are many bad news that you hear who wants to scare you from Muslims. But they are desperate. They are needy. They are handicapped. They are excluded. They are ignored. We think that the kingdom of God, the blessing of Abraham, does not belong to them, but it does. And many of them are coming to Christ. How can we do it? How can you do it? Learn more about God's work and the Muslim world. Pray for God's work among the Muslims. 
Pay special attention to your Muslim neighbor. Speak about the gospel to him, to her. And if you want, you can partner with PARS in training leaders for Iran. Uh, I have a few leaflets that I uh, put with Randy. If any one of you are interested to know more about what PARS is doing in training underground church leaders back in Iran and also training leaders for the many Iranian fellowships all over uh, the world, in Canada as well. We hope to have a branch, a kind of conference, yearly conference in Vancouver, hoping to have maybe over, over you know, 12 to 15 students here from among the Iranian community. So pray for us. Pray for us. Pray for our students. We have over, we are now this term, we have 446 who are studying with us. Iranians and a few Afghans who are getting ready to serve the Lord. God bless you and thank you for giving me time to share with you. Amen. Amen.